Thank you very much, Chairman, for that great introduction. Thanks to the National Committee and the Japan Society for hosting this event and uh, um, showcasing my book. <coughs> um, the the, the two-word summary of the book um, might be, stuff happens. Uh, and I'll explain why. Um, let me start with um, what you, uh, an incident that occurred a few months ago. It was a nasty spat between China and Japan uh, in September of last year uh, in the vicinity of the Senkaku Jiayu Islands. I, I give both names because um, the, each country has its own name and uh, I'm not going to take a position. Um, there was a standoff between a Chinese fishing boat and ships of the Japanese Coast Guard whose job it is to protect the Senkaku Islands. Um, the fishing boat captain rammed the Japan Coast Guard vessel. Uh, the captain was first detained and then he was arrested. Um, and what had started out as a modest maritime clash suddenly escalated into a, a bilateral political conflict with uh, dueling day marshes, intense media coverage, demonstrations, and uh, temporary economic sanctions on China's part against Japan. Um, th this particular clash was somewhat exceptional because the Chinese fishing boat captain was drunk at the time of the, the sort of when he ran uh, the Coast Guard vessel. But in, in a number of respects, it is just part of a pattern. Uh, a pattern of growing tensions between the two countries in the East China Sea, uh, in the maritime arena. Uh, for example, over the last few years, Chinese vessels from various maritime organizations have been testing the presence of the Japanese Coast Guard around the Diaoyu Senkaku. Chinese, the Japanese Coast Guard has resolutely blocked any intrusion. And lurking in the background of these uh, non-military organizations are the ships of the Chinese and Japanese navies. Second, uh, Beijing and Tokyo have had a long-running argument on the rights uh, for exploration and uh, exploitation of oil and gas reserves in the East China Sea. And in the middle of the 2000s, uh, that competition almost became militarized before cooler heads prevailed. Third, the Taiwan Strait issue uh, has a bearing on China's and Japan's maritime interaction. Uh, in general, uh, China's Navy and Air Force and other maritime organizations are becoming more capable. They're moving into the traditional operating areas of the Japanese Navy, the Japanese Air Force, the Japanese Coast Guard, and the U.S. Navy and the U.S. Air Force. Proximity, particularly concerning issues like uh, the Senkaku Diaoyu, increases frictions and the possibility of clashes. Now you might think that the occasional maritime clash is um, not that important in the grand scheme of things. Uh, we would all hope that uh, Tokyo and Beijing would find ways to contain any clash that occurs. Um, they certainly have reasons to do so. After all, um, uh, their economic relationship is, is very significant for both. Two-way trade is approaching $300 billion. Major Japanese companies have sustained themselves uh, by using China uh, either as a, a platform for assembly and uh, production, or as a market, or both. Uh, however, and this is my second point, um, there, there's more going on here than simply congestion in the East China Sea among various uh, maritime uh, vessels uh, and an occasional drunken trawler captain. Um, China's acquisition of modern naval and air assets is in the service of a strategic objective, and that is to gain greater control over what China calls the near seas. They want to create a strategic buffer. And if I were them, I'd want to do the same thing. Uh, China also wants to complicate uh, any U.S. intervention in any uh, Taiwan conflict uh, in order to keep us out of the fight as much as possible. Uh, China's greater maritime activism, uh, so not surprisingly, 
um, creates strategic anxiety in Japan, um, first and foremost about the sea lanes of communication, which are vital for an island country. Uh, there's also the competition to exploit natural resources, which both of them need. Um, I mentioned um, the oil and gas uh, disputes in the East China Sea. The contest over the Senkaku Gyalu began because of old uh, yet unproven reports concerning resources uh, beneath those islands. Um, and each side um, uses international law to bolster its own case. Um, all of these things are happening in the broader context of the rise of China. It's actually the revival of China's great power. Uh, the anxiety that China's rise creates among more established powers like the United States and Japan um, is uh, sort of fuels what could be a vicious circle. Um, China and Japan have become increasingly skeptical of each other's long-term intentions. Each side looks to the future, but each remembers a certain aspect of the past. Um, with all this uncertainty and anxiety comes the temptation to hedge, uh, to prepare for the worst in spite of, of dense economic interdependence. So what happens at the micro level uh, in the East China Sea gets viewed through the lens of larger macro forces. Um, furthermore, and this is my third point, um, once you look under the hood of the Chinese and Japanese political systems, uh, you come to doubt uh, the ability of each to contain any clashes that might occur. Um, and this has to do with institutions, it has to do with politics. Uh, just to take one example, civil military relations. Uh, on the Chinese side, the People's Liberation Army uh, constantly proclaims its loyalty to, communist, to the Communist Party. Uh, but it does have substantial autonomy, and that includes the autonomy to guide uh, the activities of, of non-Navy maritime organizations. Uh, the coordination mechanisms in, within the Chinese system are weak, certainly nothing uh, like uh, we have in our government. Japan's a different story. Civilian control over the military is much more intrusive. Um, there are arcane um, interpretations of, of the law and the Constitution that constrain the self-defense forces. Whether that's good for operational effectiveness is another story, and we occasionally see cases of military officers um, who are not completely uh, in tune with uh, mainstream views about Japan's past and its present. Um, then there's the question, the big issue of domestic politics. Um, public attitudes in each country about the other are negative uh, and sometimes toxic. In China, this is driven by history and the narrative of victimization. It's also bol bolstered by uh, a long-running patriotic education campaign. Uh, in Japan, attitudes toward China were pretty good uh, in the 1980s and 1970s. But ever since Tiananmen, for a variety of reasons, they have uh, uh, become more and more negative. So in both democratic Japan and populist China, public opinion limits uh, the options of policymakers to resolve problems. Uh, Chinese nationalism is uh, particularly a two-edged sword. Uh, it's directed outward at Japan and the United States, but also inward as well. So the regime is wary of appearing too weak uh, in the face of external problems. Um, there are a number of other ways in which structure and process of government decision making can turn small incidents into many crises. These have to do with the nature of leadership systems, the role of personalities, uh, turf fighting among agencies, uh, problems of intelligence organizations, mis interpreting the reality that they're looking at, uh, and so on, but I won't dwell on it. Uh, let me just sum up the core argument of my book, um, that the trajectory of Chinese and Japanese maritime activities in the East China Sea indicates that we're probably going to see more episodes like the recent one, uh, and not less. Stuff will happen. 
Um, and institutionally, just because the two governments have contained these episodes in the past doesn't mean they're going to do so in the future. Uh, neither side wants a true crisis, but each may be hard pressed to avoid one in the event uh, of, of circumstances that neither can control. Um, most important of those circumstances is the, the political environment uh, in which uh, leaders operate. Um, escalation of an incident into a serious conflict could involve the United States. Uh, we have a mutual defense treaty with Japan and we've made it clear that that applies uh, to the Senkaku Jiaoyu even though we take no position on whether Japan or China owns them. Uh, what's important is, in terms of the treaty, is uh, who controls them. Um, you know, we want good relations uh, with, with both Japan and China. We don't want to get drawn into a conflict between them, certainly not one over some uninhabited islands. Um, we would prefer not to put our commitment to Japan to the test on such an issue. But not supporting Japan in such an instance would raise serious political costs for the U.S.-Japan alliance and broader questions, and raise broader questions about U.S. credibility. So what should be done? Uh, I have a variety of suggestions in the book, uh, starting with um, easy ones, fairly easy ones and concrete. Um, I think that there are ways, there are mechanisms that China and Japan could adopt to regulate the activities of their maritime uh, organizations. Um, we developed such mechanisms with the Soviets during the Cold War, uh, but what is necessary is the political will to do them. Uh, the two militaries need to have sustained um, exchanges and dialogues, not just uh, conversations that get, get turned off when the political relationship goes sour. Uh, and the two governments need to um, follow up their agreement to actually begin carrying out joint development in the East China Sea. Um, so, uh, to conclude, I actually think that the probability of some kind of China-Japan maritime incident escalating into a major conflict um, is not that hot. Um, I'm actually much more worried about the Korean Peninsula right now. Um, but the consequences of a clash moving into a conflict are huge for China, the relations between China and Japan, for the relations between the United States and Japan, and for um, the United, uh, for China and the United States. So I think it's incumbent on all three countries to work as hard as they can to push the probability of, of East China stuff happening. Um, I think it's possible, um, but it does require a political commitment of all concern. Thank you very much for your attention. I look forward to your questions. to say is it's a fantastic book. Uh, unfortunately, I, I, it wasn't it, my copy went to the wrong office and I hadn't gotten it yet. I just glanced at it on the internet, uh, uh, various pieces of it. But uh, the point that uh, it's very, very well written. It's, uh, I mean, coming out of academics, of course, I'm used to all kinds of poisonous prose and turgid <laughs> analysis and uh, abstraction. But uh, this is very much to the point. It's easy to read. Uh, it's very, it's subtle in its understanding of policy problems. And uh, so I hope uh, everybody, everybody will get a copy. Uh, that said, I agree very much uh, that uh, Richard has put his finger on probably the most serious uh, problem in the Sino-Japanese relationship, uh, namely the East China Sea. And I think a geo ge geopolitical and a geographical approach to this uh, is quite new and quite fresh and quite important. It really is quite literally a matter of the perils of proximity. And we can see some of the issues that uh, may be arising in future uh, from the case of the um, Senkakus. That said, 
And here I want to be a devil's advocate on this because I suppose everyone else may be um, pushing the other way. Uh, and having just written a book called The Making of Northeast Asia about the relationship of Japan, China, and Korea uh, that Stanford just published, uh, I do, it's mainly oriented toward the economic side, but the, the changing nature of interdependence, the striking uh, interdependence, not only in economic terms, but also in diplomatic terms since the Asian financial crisis of uh, 1997, and the way in which Asian regionalism is moving increasingly from the very broad sort of patterns like APEC and so on, to something narrower. In, including a coordination among these three countries. Uh, as if one uh, realizes the developments along uh, that dimension, the question of how general the problems that we saw so dramatically in the Sankaku's uh, and uh, or Dalyutai, of course, uh, were, uh, and how general the problem will be in future, I think is, is definitely one uh, that we need to address. Uh, this, the Dalyutai um, Senkaku problem, as a lot of you know, happened, as Richard actually mentioned as well, happened in a rather uh, distinctive set of circumstances. Not only a, ca a captain that was wavering a bit, perhaps, but also a political uh, period in Japan that was very unusual. As I look at uh, the, 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 that Senkaku problem and how it escalated, it seems to me one of the most uh, serious problems was the fact that Japan responded so uh, slowly and so uh, legalistically uh, in, in such a fashion that it allowed the problem to spiral up in the Chinese political process at a time that was also, of course, being right before the anniversary of the invasion of Manchuria, uh, was very delicate for, for Chinese leadership and difficult, a uh, difficult time for, for them to come through with a, a resolution that looked as though it might favor Japan. Um, the, there was no Japanese foreign minister in place. Um, Khan had just uh, defeated Ozawa two days before in the, uh, in the race for the DPJ leader, and of course Ozawa had been very close to China. Uh, there are some distinctive factors in this case uh, that I, at least make me uh, somewhat hesitant to generalize. There are also some very important lessons. and. Uh, I haven't read enough of Richard's book to know if he uh, deals with these, but uh, certainly no matter how you see uh, that Sankaku Dalyutai crisis or the Sino-Japanese relationship, institutional changes in, in, in Tokyo for certain, and I would say, I don't know Beijing as well, but I should suppose in Beijing as well, in terms of conflict uh, uh, management and so on, are very much in order. To be specific, the a crisis management team uh, that had to handle this very delicate uh, diplomatic issue between the two countries was headed by a member of the National uh, Police Force. The kind of crisis management that Japan has been expecting and the way that the institutions were configured out of the, ha the Hanshin earthquake of 1995. And there, it's natural, you know, member of the police force, if you're expecting an earthquake, certainly, is the person to have in crisis management. But if it's somebody who has to decide a delicate question as to how long to hold a ship in disputed waters uh, with delicate uh, geopolitical problems looming on the other side of the East China Sea, uh, there's a question, it seems to me, as to whether the structure was appropriate. And going forward, of course, we have lessons uh, from this, this sort of uh, problem. Um, there are many, many things, as I say, that I, I think Richard points to that are quite sobering and certainly they have to deal with. But I would agree with him, uh, and he makes this point explicitly, there are also things that could be dealt with. I think I see this book as more than just a sort of uh, a, no, a, a warning that things are going to get deeper and deeper inevitably and there is impending geopolitical struggle and possibly war between China and Japan. Uh, I don't really see it that way. I see it as a situation in which there are some rather serious uh, structural uh, problems that need to be dealt with preeminently by the two parties, but of course 
also, as he mentions, uh, I think uh, the United States indirectly uh, can contribute to stabilization as well. Let me uh, go through uh, some of what I think those are. Uh, first of all, the institutions of crisis management in Japan. Uh, uh, you know, a National Security Council, perhaps, uh, Prime Minister Abe began to try to develop that, but this kind of a structure has really uh, not evolved uh, very extensively uh, in Japan uh, as yet. Um, a network of intermediaries and negotiators between the two countries. I think this actually is, is further developed than, than he perhaps uh, uh, suggests. As I look, for example, at the most, uh, two of the three most recent Chinese ambassadors <coughs> to Japan. If you take Wang Yi, for example, who is the head of the, um, now head of the Taiwan Affairs Office, uh, he speaks fluent Japanese. Uh, he was the author of the reconciliation. If we look four or five years back, uh, Japan-China relations, of course, were tortured over the, the problem of Yasukuni Shrine. It was Wang Yi, together with Shiozaki, the head of the uh, uh, Kampo Chokan the, the, uh, uh, in, in Japan, and Prime Minister Abe, who uh, historically had been very, very hawkish in relation to China, of course, reestablished a, a very much more uh, conciliatory relationship. So I think looking at the networks uh, for crisis management, certainly the institutions of management, to where he uh, pointed to some sobering problems, you know, civil military relations, can the generals be kept under control, or the the, the people at the working level? Do they communicate in the ways that they should? Do we have the contingency planning to deal with crises? Those things are all very well, uh, I think it's, it's certainly in order. But then uh, in terms, at the level of diplomacy, I think that slights both some uh, leaders of the past, as I say, I think Wang Yi is one, at a certain stage, Prime Minister Abe uh, was that way. Uh, each of the, Prime Minister Fukuda today, uh, who was former Japanese Prime Minister, who is now Director of the Advisory Board of the Boao Forum, for example, has been quite conciliatory toward China and playing a, a role as an intermediary. Um, another one, the new ambassador, uh, Chinese ambassador to Japan, Chen Yongma, has uh, over 15 years of experience in Japan, graduated from Soka University uh, in Japan, and is very experienced in dealing um, uh, between the two countries. And we could certainly probably, we could point to a number of Japanese diplomats uh, as well. The general trading companies, obviously they have very strong stakes in stable relations. Um, uh, Richard pointed to trade interdependence, you know, close to $300 billion of trade. Since 2007, Japan-China trade's been larger than trade between the United States and Japan. So uh, Japan stakes, I think, in terms of a, a peaceful resolution of many of these issues are there. That said, certainly, and he, the point that he, he uh, points to, I think, is really very apt. If this is presented in the form of um, some kind of a sudden, unexpected crisis that stirs nationalistic uh, sentiments on both sides, in the countries that don't have well-established mechanisms structurally to deal uh, with these sort of problems. And the East China Sea is the quintessential case. Uh, then, it seems to me, uh, we do have a serious problem. So that's the, uh, the perils of proximity. Um, moving to the longer run future, Maybe let me say just a word or two in conclusion. I do think that uh, there have been a political shifts. We mentioned the negative ones. Under Hu Jintao, I think it's important to note the contrast between the, the dynamics of Japan-China relations under Hu Jintao and what they were under Zhang Jimin. Of course, President uh, Zhang and his family had personal experiences that made the war a special meaning uh, for them. Um, in the case of Hu Jintao, however, 
I think if you look at, uh, at, at the, uh, for the president, President Hu, if you look at many of his advisors, if you look at some other important figures, Bo Xilai, um, and a number of others, certainly there have been people who have, at the macro level, at the national level, who have wanted to develop closer ties with Japan. And as became so dramatically clear under both Prime Ministers Abe and Fukuda, in contrast, say, to uh, Koizumi. Um, and on the Japanese side, conversely, we could certainly point to, I would say, every one of the leaders since Koizumi uh, has uh, had the um, desire to have uh, better relations with China. And of course, most strikingly and counterintuitively, uh, uh, Abe, but also for that matter, Aso, of course, who had been uh, rather conservative and close to the Taiwan lobby and so on, but in office, uh, deepened relations. Um, you're getting, in particular, and let me close, close with this, this triangle of China, of Japan, China, and Korea, uh, which seems to, to me, certainly in economic terms, but also in diplomatic terms and sort of functional uh, bureaucratic terms, like ministers of finance coordinating, magic ministers, environment ministers, and so on, um, coordin coordinating. Uh, much more uh, intimately, certainly, than was true be before the Asian uh, financial crisis. And uh, these, there's going to be a major uh, foreign minister summit in Kyoto next month. There's going to be a major trilateral summit, not within the context of ASEAN plus three, which was true for so long, but since 2008, these have been trilateral conferences among these three alone which is the way uh, that it's going to be held in Tokyo. And they're setting up a secretariat in Incheon uh, this year and negotiating a trilateral free trade agreement. Now, the international system certainly is a series of tiers, multi-tiers. Um, US, Japan, Korea seems to me certainly is another important tier. Uh, as an American, I also think that should be, be given uh, uh, precedent, not precedence, but should be given serious consideration as one uh, form in a very complex multilateral architecture which is arising uh, in Northeast Asia. Um, and certainly to relate that to Richard's book, through various trilateral mechanisms, through uh, bilateral uh, interchange, through hotlines. There are several new ones of those kinds in Northeast Asia, too. Um, hopefully, the problems that he presents so well can be deal, deal with. They, I think, can be unconsciously optimistic, but it's always good to see the dangers that lie ahead. Thank you. Good evening, and thanks so much for having me. It's uh, great to be here at Japan Society. Haven't seen Jan in a long time. Uh, Devin, uh, my buddy, uh, called me up, emailed me a couple months ago, and asked if I'd be his date on Valentine's. <laughs> I thought it was kind of experimental, but what the hell. <laughs> here I am. Uh, congratulations to Richard. Uh, I haven't read the book yet. I've certainly seen some of the release around it, and it looks really good. And, uh, and, and having now heard the pricey over 10, 15 minutes, uh, I'm certainly um, on board uh, with, the, with the broad direction uh, and his orientation, uh, both in terms of the fact that we're likely to see more of this, but also that it's probably not likely to spiral into confrontation. I, too, am much more concerned about North Korea as a proximate serious risk. I'll tell you why I'm concerned. I don't know what's going on in North Korea. <laughs> You don't know what's going on in North Korea. Even these guys don't know what's going on in North Korea. But the Chinese know better than the rest of us. They've got better intel on it than anybody on North Korea. They don't share all of it. But in situations like this, I always like to look at what the people who really know what's going on are doing. The Chinese aren't stupid. Right. Steve Krasner used to say, my old professor, stupidity is not an analytically interesting category for political scientists. Right? <laughs> so they, they look at North Korea, he didn't say that. It didn't, he didn't work out for him as, as director of policy planning, but as a political scientist, it was great. Um, 
And uh, you look at the fact that the, the Chinese are so unwilling to deploy even a little bit of serious pressure or leverage on North Korea, despite the fact that not doing so clearly is driving the South Koreans and the Japanese much closer towards the US. Not only on security issues, but in case of Japan, I would say even more broadly than that, I think the strength and the rapidity of the ability of Prime Minister Khan to move on the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which I saw him do at Davos, to the surprise and appreciation of the CEOs, Japanese CEOs that were there. I mean, clearly North Korea underlines some of that security orientation. The Chinese are behaving the way they are in North Korea despite all of that, which implies that they are very, very concerned about pushing North Korea even a bit in the context of this transition to an unknown 28-year-old third son. The one thing I'll tell you as a political scientist, transition and totalitarian are two T's that do not go well together. They don't play nicely. And so, yeah, we should be concerned. I'm not worried much about Iran this year. I'm not worried much about Iraq this year. I'm not worried much about India, Pakistan, despite Pakistan kind of falling apart, civilian government perspective. But North Korea is the one geopolitical risk kind of looming out there, yes, in East Asia, that I think we need to worry about could get hairy. And so I agree. But most most of what I do is not sort of the hardline security stuff. Most of what I look at is how geopolitics and geoeconomics come together. And so maybe a couple uh, broad point pictures that I hope will inform or color some of what we're talking about here um, in the East Asian risk environment. So the Financial Times and The Economist, both over the last week, have done these sort of interesting pieces, messages which resonate with me that say, gosh, we've got to start paying attention globally to political risk. It's really important. It's becoming obvious. And both of them have decided they've come upon this realization because they've seen three weeks of straight headlines on Tunisia and Egypt and oil prices going up and the rest. And I gotta tell you, I mean, political risk is critical, but it's not because of the Middle East. Overwhelmingly, structurally, the rise in political risk in the world is because of what's happening in Asia and the global rebalancing that is occurring as a consequence of that. You look at Europe, Europe's in a lot of trouble right now, we know that. But the Europeans are being honest with each other. There's a rebalancing which is going on in Europe. We've gone from east-west to north-south and some countries like Hungary find themselves in the south, who knew? But nonetheless, they're dealing with it. And there is an understanding that what historically had been convergence in Europe, right? Everybody gets the same ratings. Everybody gets the same, you know, sort of credit. Um, actually did not reflect underlying reality. And so now Europe is diverging, right? With very different sort of investment outcomes and risk uh, portfolios and all the rest. And as you go from convergence to divergence, you go from win-win to zero sum. There is a bill in Europe. The bill is going to be paid. If the German taxpayers pay more, the Greeks can pay less, and vice versa. And they're having that conversation. And it's ugly. It's messy. It causes consternation and palpitations in the markets, but it's happening. Now, I would argue, to bring this conversation to Asia, that there is a similar process that should be happening globally. There was a convergence. It was called globalization. Countries in the West, including Japan, reached out to developing states and brought them closer. With our rules, our multinational corporations brought their manufactured goods and their labor, their markets, closer to us. That was win-win. It was convergence. We're now seeing divergence. Emerging markets are growing like topsy. China, first of all, and the developed world is not. And there needs to be a rebalancing, and yet we continue to talk about win-win. When I was in Davos, every Chinese official said win-win. When I'm in the United States, everyone talks about we need a level playing field. Great, but we want to level it in one direction, they want to level it in the other. Now, to bring this specifically to Japan-China relations, I am concerned about the security side. But I guess I'm more concerned about the fact that security is increasingly becoming economic as opposed to just military. I mean, the one point that I thought was really interesting about the real, the recent flare-up between Japan and China was rare earths. And the fact that the Chinese thought that a good time to announce 
uh, a suspension of the export of rare earths to Japan was in the midst of this little blow up. Now, I don't know if you guys remember when CNOC was trying to buy Unical a number of years ago, and it didn't go through because Congress raised it, CFIUS raised it as an issue, but everyone thought of it as an oil issue. How many folks actually knew or remembered that Unical owned Molycor? Mom, hands? <laughs> Polycore is the largest producer of rare earths in the United States. Kind of meaningful. It's the reason the Chinese wanted it. No one was focused on it at the time. I was talking to Pentagon a few weeks ago, and I talked to them about this specifically, and they didn't know. I'm hoping it's just those guys, not the other guys. But nonetheless, 57% uh, of the world's rare earths are in Chinese hands, but they're going through them quickly, and they need more, and they're stopping to produce. Is that going to hurt Japan? You betcha. Right? Now, there is... A sense. I mean, a lot of Japanese CEOs, there's no question, trade between Japan and China is picking up. But you talk to Japanese CEOs and ask them about the nature of the underlying contract, social contract, between Japan and China, which is we provide technology, you give us market share. It's breaking down. It's breaking down in the US, it's breaking down in Japan, it's breaking down in Europe. Why? Well, because the Chinese need increasingly much more sophisticated technology. Toyota was willing to provide a lot, but when the Chinese say, we want your drivetrain, Toyota says no, because that's the crown jewel. And then the Chinese aren't so interested in further inward Toyota investment in China, because what else are they getting out of it? Meanwhile, willingness to provide access to the Chinese market share and willingness to compete effectively with Japanese and Western multinationals around the world using support of Chinese state-owned enterprises and privately owned national champions, that goes up. And so in the United States, no matter, labor's been destroyed in this country for a while. And the lobby, the labor lobby doesn't matter much internationally except on a few small issues. But the corporate lobby matters. And the corporate lobby, overwhelmingly in the United States, has been, we don't care what the rest of you say. We're not looking at human rights. We're not looking at security issues with Taiwan. We want open policy with China because we can sell 1.3 billion sneakers to these guys, right? Pairs of sneakers, that's 2.6 billion sneakers. That's a lot of sneakers, right? And increasingly, we are seeing that that corporate lobby is gone. There's some people that still feel good about it, but there are a lot that don't. And Jeff Einelt, the new advisor, to the White House is one of these serious skeptics who gave an interview to the FT saying, I don't think the Chinese think we can make any money that they don't want us to. He then retracted that when he realized he was on the record. It's a little embarrassing for GE in China, but nonetheless. I was talking to Undersecretary Bob Hormats in Davos a couple weeks ago. We sat down and talked about this for half an hour. He said, expect to see industrial policy. That, by the way, if there's media here, off the record, right? But nonetheless, on technology, these China. I have those conversations with Japanese CEOs all the time. They are concerned about this issue. So, yes, I'm worried about North Korea. Yes, Chinese military buildup, of course, is muscle flexing. But let's be clear. From my perspective looking at China, and I'm not the China expert here at all, but when the financial crisis hit, Everyone in China, everyone in Chinese government realized that this was a real hit to the United States and its place in the world. There were two responses to that. On the military side, the response was, hmm, this is interesting. Let's shake the branches a little bit and see if any juicy fruit falls off. Let's just see how committed the U.S. really is to all of these historic connections and security ties in Asia. And let's see how committed American allies are to their relationship to the U.S. But don't go crazy. Let's just shake the branches a little bit. Just want to know a little more assertive behavior on the part of the Chinese military. On the part of the economic leaders, it was a very different response. It was, oh my God, our entire strategy is massively dependent on the West. We're going to manufacture all of this stuff to them. We've got immense exposure for U.S. Treasuries, and it's probably not sustainable. And we need to hedge and decouple quickly, or we're not going to have the economic growth we need to maintain our own political stability and therefore survival. Now, the former issue exercises us more right now 
But the latter issue, I would argue, should concern us much more. Maybe it doesn't because we have two-year electoral cycles here and we have multinational corporations that have shareholders and look at short-term return, short-term compensation. But frankly, ultimately, it's the much bigger risk in East Asia. It's the much bigger security issue in East Asia. And as someone who looks at global political risk, that's the one I would suggest that we focus on. So that's like 10 minutes for me, and hopefully we can mix it up with these guys. So thanks a lot. Um, take issue with something that the other has said, expand on it? Um, let me just say that um, I agree with uh, everything that he said about the sort of security implications of global economics. Uh, that wasn't the book I wrote, but uh, it's uh, an extremely important point, uh, including the one about the corporate America as the political support base uh, for uh, the U.S.-China relationship. Uh, with respect to um, a couple of Ken's points, um, um, clearly economic relationships are very important. Clearly um, intermediaries are important and dialogues are important. Um, I think that, that some elements of the two systems haven't gotten the memo. Um, they they uh, have a different sort of conception of their country's national interests than sort of what's called the mainstream. Um, one um, element that uh, hasn't gotten the memo are the People's Liberation Army in China <coughs> and some elements in Japan uh, in the sort of Japanese uh, sort of security orbit. Uh, the publics haven't gotten the memo, um, particularly the Chinese public. Um, and um, the, the um, North Koreans haven't gotten the memo. I mean, if anything can drive a wedge between China on the one hand and Japan and Korea on the other, it's North Korea. Um, so I mean, the, we sort of have a real struggle here for sort of who, con who controls the agenda and who benefits uh, either by sort of maximization of cooperation or something else. But I'd rather. Yeah, I don't want to uh, to go on too long on this. But I, again, I would just uh, accent uh, networks, including a lot in the mill um, mill communications area. In the last uh, five years, there's been, for example, the Koreans, uh, the, the South Koreans, and the PLA have a hotline. The PLA Air Force have a hotline. Uh, there are a whole series of new forms of uh, communication of that, of that kind. I agree with you. Uh, populism, uh, the command and control, the inadvertent crisis, you know, that is certainly, that those kind of things are really right at the heart of the problem. And perhaps just to add a word relating to uh, Ian's, uh, what you had to say about the uh, economic dimensions of security becoming more and more important. I couldn't agree more and more, more on that. Just one element that we haven't talked about between China and Japan, the growth differential. The fact, of course, just this uh, in recent days, uh, or this 2010 was the first year that um, the, Jap the Chinese economy was larger in nominal terms than Japan. Of course, there's different ways to calculate this, but the growth differential is so huge, and it seems to be so sustained over time. Of course, this allows China to bid for resources in new ways along the lines, or to, 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 to hold resources of different kinds in new ways. So the, uh, you know, the, the economic implications or the security implications of growth differentials seem to be something that we shouldn't forget. I would just like to ask a question, a clarification. Um, and Richard, you and I have a mutual friend in China who believes that the fact that China does not have a National Security Council is one of the single most dangerous things that can can have some severe consequences when it comes to this escalation and, and crisis management. 
Um, I thought that the Japanese do have a National Security Council a la ours, but what I heard you say, Kent, is that there really isn't one that's very effective. Is that the case? Well, and it, what's happening in Korea as well? Do it was said, uh, there was one that uh, Prime Minister Abe uh, formally uh, set one up, uh, Koike Yuriko, who had been Defense Minister. She was the uh, National Security Advisor, but you know, it just hasn't been institutionalized and the, the key ministries also uh, are adverse to this because that undermines the, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the Defense Ministry, and so on. So I think this is a problem. Uh, there is a better structure of that kind in Korea, of course, partly because of the, uh, of course, the, of this pressing national security problems they have. And a, that's right, uh, Richard makes a very important point. The, pre the presidential system, of course, uh, much more institutionalized. Also, the National Assembly of Korea, just one house that can make rapid decisions. I think something that plagues Japan again and again is a very, very complex legislative process that makes action difficult and forces the ministers to always be in diet hearings and unable to travel internationally and so on. Well, we have a president, but we also have secretaries who are in cabinet hearings all the time, too, unfortunately. I mean, I would make the argument, I, I do think that it's an issue that the Japanese don't have the sort of public policy institutions training to create a real cadre, professional cadre of strategic, you know, sort of outward foreign policy thinkers. The lack of a National Security Council, Koike, was not exactly a strategic thinker. She was wildly disparaged when she got that position. She was not impressive on these issues in person. Um, but that's one half of the puzzle. I mean, the U.S. and Japan talk about, while well, the U.S. and China are talking about big strategic issues, even if we're not fixing them, the U.S. and Japan are talking about length of runways in Okinawa. It's remarkably tactical, right? It's not happening. And that's starting to change, but only starting to. But let's keep in mind as well, it's another issue. So so we're moving from more security, hard security, to economic issues. Japan has many. The United States has the Department of Commerce, <laughs> right? The United States has the Department of Energy separate from the Department of Commerce. The, the ability of the United States to think strategically about business and industrial policy is, is incredibly limited compared to Japan. And in this environment, that's going to hurt the United States. So the lack of coordination actually occurs institutionally on both sides. Okay, anything else from what you heard each other say that you want to? Let's hear from the audience. Okay, so when we hear from you, um, I'll call on you. We'd ask you to please stand. Do we have microphones or is the room? Don't get okay. started. Wait for the microphone. Give us your name and your affiliation if you have one and you want to tell us. Um, and please make it a question, not a lengthy speech. Um, I think those are my only instructions. And right up here. Oh, and I one of the if you have a follow up question, if you really want to continue on, you can, um, just raise your hand again with two fingers, and I'll try to call. Is that some? Yes. Calvin always to be that comment. Um, <coughs> the impression I get of the Japanese political scene at this point, uh, at least the MHK, is that uh, the politicians are more interested in infighting in the next election than they are in, in the larger uh, uh, issues of the day. And uh, I get the feeling that uh, Foreign Minister Mayahara, uh, he was like a deer caught in the headlines in, in uh, Moscow. He just uh, was pathetic. And I was just wondering what you make of the political situation, I mean the panel. Well, I thought you were describing the United States when you talked about politicians uh, worrying about the next election and not. Uh, um, I, uh, I tend to agree that the imperatives of, sort of the political system and who holds power are deflecting Japan from making some really serious policy choices. Um, it's hurting Japan and it's hurting Japan's reputation. I think what we have to remember is the difficulty f from the perspective of the politicians of foreseeing the future. It's very, very, uh, given the logjam in the upper house of diet, of course the DPJ doesn't have a majority there. There could very well, uh, the prime minister, we may, may see a change next month even. 
or in the next couple of months. Uh, and there could be a crisis that could deepen that would force a political re realignment. It's, the politicians really don't know who they're going to be aligned from with, even relatively uh, short periods of time in the future. I think it's the uncertainty, of this, which is rooted in the, the structural situation. You know, the lack of a strong presidency or a strong executive, the, uh, the complexities of the diet, and then a uh, political one-party dominant system in decay, as it has been for the last 15 years. So it's, you know, I, I mean, I've known Maihara for a long time, and I don't think in, in his private conversations you know, he's quite, he is quite strategic. And I think as Yen and several of the others know too, and Richard know, they know too. Uh, I think the problem is more structural than it is intellectual. Yes, Rick, have a question? Mary Bill Knapp, Foreign Policy Association. Mr. Bremer, you mentioned that China is reluctant to take strong action against North Korea, is that because you're afraid if the government falls, they'll pour in hordes of North Koreans to China, or is it because they really like to have the thing sort of not settled in North Korea? Oh, I, mean, I think it's it's hard to know um, exactly what they're afraid of, but it seems to me it could go one of two ways. Um, one is that they're concerned um, that by pushing the North Koreans in the middle of this transition, uh, that they could destabilize the regime, and then you have all of the you know incumbent uh, refugee issues and the like, and they don't want instability. The second is that they could provoke uh, further, more serious provocations from the North Koreans. I'm going to tell you, it's one thing for the North Koreans to sink the Chona, pretty bad stuff. It's another thing for them to shell a South Korean island several weeks before Hu Jintao comes to the United States for a summit. I mean, you want to talk about a slap in the face and we don't care and go ahead, put this on your agenda, it doesn't matter. That is a big deal. That implies pretty strongly that Chinese are not actually telling the North Koreans which step to take. They did not get the North Koreans, I agree, did not get the memo. And. Uh, you know, I, it seems to me that the Chinese believe that this is a destabilizing time. Now, there are two reasons it could be destabilizing in North Korea, in terms of the transition. Right? One is that the North Koreans are doing all of this bad stuff because they think that they need to show that with this new leader that's unknown internationally, that he's going to be consistent and, and don't try to take advantage of him. That's possible. But it's also possible that you're trying to install this guy that's unknown inside among North Korean elites, military, and the rest. And Kim Jong-il doesn't believe that he's going to be able to affect a, a stable transition, and so they're putting the country on a war footing. If the latter is true, that's really dangerous. If the latter is true, or if the Chinese think it's true, they would be much more reluctant to push them. All I can say is that from my best understanding of every time I talk to this with Chinese officials, and I don't pretend they're saying anything more honest to me than they're saying anybody else out there on this, they're going to keep their, their hands pretty guarded, it does seem that they've been surprised by the North Koreans a lot here. The North Koreans aren't doing what they want them to do. And I do think there's been, there's been a sense in Washington that's starting to change that the Chinese really could, if they wanted to, they could do a lot more. And, and I think the Chinese are like, this is, this is a bad idea. We really, I know you think that you want us to use this leverage, actually you're wrong. You don't want us to use this leverage because it could really blow things up. And, and the fact that we have a different strategic orientation, it's a little bit like the US and Israel on Iran, right? I mean, there are analogs here in terms of what the Israelis are prepared to push to have us do and what we're prepared to have the Chinese, you know, sort of the same kind of concept. What's your agenda? No, I think that fits it pretty well. Okay, let's just go right up. The woman on the third row. Uh, it was mentioned a few times that it seemed unlikely that China and Japan would really, I suppose, come to serious blows over an issue in the coming years. Um, I was wondering, what kind of situation would you envision that could come to blows? And also, what role do you think the United States would play in such a situation? Is that to anyone on the panel? Pretty much. Um, um, 
sort of, I think we, we've all suggested the um, more likely situation now is probably the Korean Peninsula, and you can imagine it in a couple of different ways. Uh, the first is that um, China continues to um, sort of tolerate North Korean uh, provocations against the South, but the South's policy has changed, or at least it says its policy has changed. And instead of absorbing uh, provocations, um, it seems like it's moving towards uh, responding with punishment. And so that creates the, the possibility of escalation. North Korea hits the South, the South hits back, North Korea hits again, and uh, it, it's out of control. Now we understand that, the South probably understands that, and we're working on that. But you know, if that cycle of escalation went too far, it uh, might bring China and the United States in. Uh, and if the United States comes in, uh, then Japan probably comes in too. And Japan is starting to talk with Korea, South Korea, about the role it might play on the peninsula. Um, the other way it could happen, and again, this is um, sort of low probability, high impact, is that the transition in Korea goes, in North Korea goes really badly. That despite everything that the Chinese have done, um, despite the hopes of everybody that it will be uh, sort of gradual and um, fairly stable, that it's not. That something happens inside that system. And the outside stakeholders are, are not ready for it. And they haven't coordinated their moves in advance. And so again, um, through a sort of set of circumstances, um, uh, China ends up on one side in the United States and South Korea and Japan end up on the other. Stuff can happen. Do you have something? I guess I was just going to say, I, on, as far as the Korean Peninsula goes, it's hard for me to imagine the Japanese really getting involved in the Korean Peninsula, just partly because of, for the historical reasons and most of the things that would need to be done, I suppose the United States would be largely in place to do. I go back to the, some of the things Richard talks about in his book, which really are uh, uh, sobering, the East China Sea. And then just to add one word, I do think that if the American presence fundamentally changes in Okinawa, that, that the whole situation would become much more delicate and potentially explosive. And I'm not talking about them, I mean, for, I mean Kadena and, and some of the other major facilities the U.S. has. Okay, um, gentlemen back here. Gary Tillery, of course, three partners. Um, I have a question, follow-up question on Korea. Uh, one thing that I noticed after these provocations by the North was what you mentioned, which was the change in South Korean policy. Two, I, I did note, as, as Ken mentioned, that there are now high-level contacts, military contacts, between the South Koreans and the Chinese. Um, and in the wake of all these incidents, I noticed, uh, I think it was about a month ago, they reported that the North Koreans reached out for talks. I can't remember the North Koreans reaching out for talks. So I'm wondering whether the Chinese have gotten irritated and have put some pressure on the North, whether there's any evidence of that, or whether the policy of the South cause the North to reach out because they realize that their provocations won't go unanswered, whether anybody has an opinion about that. You may not have any idea, um, since we don't really know much about the North. Um, go back to Ian's first principle. When it comes to North Korea, we don't know. Uh, we, we really don't. Um, I, 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 the North Koreans do have a sort of pattern of, of creating a difficult situation and then turning on a charm offensive. Um, and sometimes this is correlated with the food situation in North Korea, which right now happens to be bad. And so now they're, they're making knives. Um, I think that, that China, which has become the key advocate of, of dialogue and negotiations, uh, probably nudged the North Koreans 
uh, to in that direction, and you know, we went into it with uh, certain standards and expectations uh, which could not be met, and so the, the military talks that um, started um, last week um, were sort of suspended. Uh, so North Korea can say to China, we tried. Uh, and it's the, the South Korean traders who are responsible for the breakdown. But we do know, part of this question, yes, we do know just from talking to Chinese friends and colleagues that the Chinese are irritated with the North Koreans. Oh, yeah, and there's sure. no question of that part here. Um, okay, let's start this part of the room. Um, let's stand back and on the aisle. Which was that? No, in front of me. Okay. Hi, I'm Richard Grady's from Russell and Company. Uh, I have an impression that the PLA and the PLA Navy is in a fairly cocky frame of mind, and that they have their own agenda uh, that may or may not coincide with the political agenda of Hu Jintao and the other people running the political side of China. And I wonder if we're in line for some sort of an incident that might be more akin to the uh, naval ship Implacable. I think it was a year and a half ago where the um, Chinese vessels almost uh, took that thing under control. It was, remember that was a small naval ship that was uh, uh, surveying the South China Sea, I think. Uh, is there any probability that this might be on the PLA's agenda without them telling anybody else about it? And is anybody doing any scenario planning, either in the U.S., Japan, uh, uh, to deal with such a situation? Um, first point, um, I, I, the um, PLA Navy and the other sort of maritime elements in China are um, sort of acting in a fairly robust way in different parts of, of the East China Sea and the South China Sea, or they have been. Um, I do not think that this is a separate PLA Navy agenda. Uh, I think that uh, this reflects a sort of thought out um, sort of strategy or objective that um, the Central Military Commission has approved, and Hu Jintao is the chairman of that commission. How the PLA Navy implements that, uh, that policy objective, which is to sort of push out uh, China's uh, strategic perimeter uh, away from its coast, um, you know, that you know, may be left more to them. My understanding on the South China Sea is that after the impeccable incident in March of 2009, um, you know, both sides cooled their jets a little bit, and so the recent things you hear from American officials is uh, are that uh, the situation is more under control um, than it was. Um, and um, but PLA Navy does you know has been given a strategic objective and and uh, you know that uh, is sort of pushing them into areas where we operate. So we need rules of the road uh, to uh, sort of regulate our respective activities. Uh, I agree completely, and I think we've seen this and and, and, and we've seen responses to this recently when uh, you had uh, Secretary of Defense go out to. Beijing recently for those, the first in, in time they've had those bilaterals in quite some time, and then the Chinese uh, decided that they were going to do this buzz of the stealth plane, the, G the J-70, I guess it was, at the same time. It was clear from talking to people um, around Gates of Delegation that, um, that Hu Jintao's response at that point was literally one of surprise. Now, do I think that, that was a rogue PLA element that decided they were going to embarrass you know, sort of the, the president of the Chinese uh, government at the time the Secretary of Defense was there to show the military strong? Absolutely not. Um, I think that, uh, that China is becoming more complicated. There are more moving pieces. I think things happen, and I suspect that some people lost their jobs on the basis of that. We're just not going to find out about it, mm -hmm. right? I mean, in Israel, when um, you know Biden went out to talk to Netanyahu, 
And at the same time he was there, they made an announcement on additional settlements in the West Bank. Uh, people lost their jobs. The, the policy was in place. They were planning on being hardline, but not to have the announcement when Biden was there. It's complicated. There are a bunch of people, and sometimes they're not very well managed. And I think we see a lot of that because the underlying policy is let's be more assertive. That doesn't mean that you've got rogue elements that are doing crazy things. The second part of your question, are people doing planning and analysis from this? Certainly, you know, people with Naval War College and lots of people all over Washington and elsewhere are gaming us out and thinking about it. But I think we also have to step back and, and think about the fact that you know, the United States and China and lots of other countries in the world and China have very different views of what currently are rules of the road. And Chinese look at the United States and Europe and times when we're berating them over things like energy use, et cetera, and say, well, you know, that's fine, but you guys used a whole lot more energy before we came on the scene, and why can't we have a chance to do that? And it's you guys who decided that the continental shelf or whatever, the 200 mile economic zone goes so far, and we don't agree with that. And so we don't like it that your guys are within 200 nautical miles of our shore, even if you say by international rules that that's okay because we weren't part of creating those international rules. Now, we say that those are international rules and that should be good for everyone. We have to think about the fact that China's perspective of it and how actually we would react in this country if a Chinese trawler just was patrolling you know, 110 odd miles off the coast of Los Angeles. Would we be quite so calm about it as we want the Chinese to be? So. Just I was just kidding, for 30 or 40 years. Yeah. Well, we worked out, though, finally some rules in the road with Russians so that we weren't bumping into each other like we are with the Chinese. Nick? Ian. Uh, uh, introduce yourself. Nick Platt, uh, Asia Society. Ian uh, cited uh, globalization as a force for convergence, bringing us all together. Uh, and now it says that we're in a stage of divergence. My question, first of all, is can globalization be reversed? Or is it an inexorable sort of force of integration, technology, and so forth? Um, and added to that is the question in view of the rest of our conversation is that the fact that North Korea has been the most resistant to globalization that makes it the problem that it is? Well, there's no question um, that the enormous absence, the isolation, the extraordinary isolation that North Korea has managed to maintain has created a lot of danger because as we see in Tunisia and Egypt and other places, um, the access to that information, which is difficult to keep out, when it starts to dribble in, you create a lot of instability very quickly. I mean, foreign direct investment in North Korea, a little CNN or Al Jazeera in North Korea would cause havoc with that country. The North Koreans are highly aware of that. So when a lot of people say, well, what you really need to do is reduce sanctions and just come in, that makes sense. Well, actually, no, because if you were to do that, the North Koreans are pretty savvy, you know, that they would immediately take steps to ensure that that doesn't continue. Kind of like the Cubans have historically. When you had Carter and other folks that were trying to open up, they say, no, 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 keep it closed, right? It's useful for them to maintain power. North Korea is by far the most totalitarian state in the world. It is the, most, it is the country most threatened by globalization. Globalization is fairly inexorable. Now, you asked that initial question, which I think is really important, which is to what extent globalization can be reversed. Two points. I think that the kind of globalization that we have experienced is not a globalization that just brings the world closer together. As, as Jan said, and she mentioned on the security perspective, but the same argument can be made very strongly on the economic perspective, the Chinese believe that the globalization that we've been experiencing, the rules of the road, the sharing of the benefits, the industrialization, has benefited one set of actors much more than it's benefited the others because they've the one, been the ones setting the rules. They wish to change that. That's gonna create zero sumness. That's still globalization. You're still gonna have all sorts of trade, 
but it's going to be trade oriented with different purposes under different rules towards different countries. And that's going to create different relative gains and losses. So I, I, I don't think that globalization gets reversed, but I think the globalization that we have driven and have benefited from, uh, probably to the greatest degree of anyone in the world, that gets reversed. And I think that's something we're going to be very uncomfortable with. Mm -hmm. um, this gentleman over just one, just briefly, it seems to me that we have a real semantic issue when we talk about globalization. There are all kinds of globalization. Just from the one uh, trip many years ago was in Kodale that I, when I was in North Korea. I was struck, so and you've got plenty of Syrians, Ethiopians, the shower of the Juche flame is a, has a brick from Brooklyn, New York. Uh, you know, glo there are different kinds of globalization in this world. Uh, uh, reversal, very difficult, but attenuation. Is it even possible that the pattern of deep, in, deep interdependence that China has had or has de developed with the world, that that could be transformed into something else? Of course, historically, if we looked at the Cultural Revolution, there was a period when that happened. The trade dependence on the United States is not what it was in 2002. There, there can be modifications and nuances, and there's a lot of different globalizations, I think. Stephen, my contention that for the next two years, maybe longer, we're going to enter a period of intense uh, policy and maybe even governmental instability in the United States, harder and harder to read. How do the nations, if, if that's right, the nations you've talked about, read this? And how will this, this change in the United States, this period of policy uncertainty, how will that influence the, the, the uh, relationships that we've been discussing this evening? Well, just one quick answer. Uh, those countries that depend on the United States for providing whatever uh, will look at our policy paralysis with dismay. Those that see a benefit from it uh, will try to take advantage of it. I would also note that we're not the only ones who are going through political transitions. Uh, China, 2012-2013, they will do a whole turnover of their um, sort of political elite. Um, South Korea, presidential elections in late 2012. Taiwan, presidential elections in March 2012. Russia, I don't know what the month is, but that's 2012 as well. Um, sort of everybody's going to be turning over, or most people are going to be turning over at the same time. I think, uh, I, I think that uh, there's actually not a lot of uncertainty about U.S. policy uh, looking around the world. Uh, Obama doesn't have a doctrine. Uh, Bush had a doctrine. You may not have liked it, but he had one. Carter, Clinton, Reagan, lots of doctrines. We're two years into the Obama administration. The guy's got a Nobel Peace Prize. There's no doctrine. I'm not saying that to be critical. I'm actually saying that because Obama's foreign policy is fairly clear. It is tactical and it is risk management. You want to talk about risks, right? I mean, we just saw this in Egypt. You know, do not get me over my skis. Don't get farther ahead. We might have to deal with anybody here. Don't go crazy, right? China. We just had the most important summit that the U.S. has hosted in 20 years between the world's two most important economic and political players right now. And with an enormous amount of foresight and planning, virtually nothing happened. And that was considered the best possible outcome, probably rightly, because things could have gotten bad. I, I think there's a lot of, there's a reasonable amount of certainty looking forward on the U.S. over the next couple of years in terms of where foreign policy is going. I do believe that that is, uh, you know, comparative, not a lot of activity from the U.S. Um, and those are things that some countries will see as problematic, that want support, the Saudis, the Israelis, the Japanese, if they start thinking about foreign policy. Um, though, though TPP, again, strong support for the TPP. Give Prime Minister, I mean, I gotta tell you, I was sitting next to Yuriko Kawaguchi, former foreign minister, when, I, when, when uh, Prime Minister Khan was giving a speech, right? And I mean, she would, I am used to, you know, the Japanese just hating Davos because the Prime Minister goes, it's on a Saturday, it's the last day to give a speech, nobody cares. This time around, it was like, pretty good speech. 
you know, I'll reach now. And uh, you know, let's let's work with the Americans. So, look, well, he may not be there in four weeks. So, who knows? But but and, and, and I should I should never get excited about Japan strategically. I know that is a, it's, it's just I'm young. It's an it's, it's an occupational hazard. But but I, I, I think uh, I, I think there was something there this time. Uh, Tristan Zhang of Helix Capital Partners. Um, my question is regarding the recent developments in the Chinese advances in the uh, high-speed railway systems. They have decided and we are in discussions to uh, negotiate deals with other Southeast Asian countries such as Laos or Thailand. Um, how does Japan plan to react to, uh, to these set of events? Or do they feel challenged by this? Are they going to uh, compete for leadership in the, uh, in the Asian areas? Thank you. I think uh, definitely regarding high-speed rail, uh, of course Japan has some of the best technology in the world. It's a, sli it's a different sort from uh, uh, European, uh, very much oriented toward fail-safe systems, computerized. Uh, there haven't been any accidents at all, of course, on the Shinkansen since it was founded in 1964. Yes, Meti, um, Foreign Minister Maihara, is personally quite interested in this. Right across the government, there's a lot of interest in this, and uh, putting JPEG money, um, in particular, into it. Yes, I think they do plan to compete. I think they plan to compete too, but I think there's an awful lot of concern um, about the fact that the Chinese government has been able to grab technology and expand dramatically what their capacity is. Arnold Schwarzenegger, who, you know, in California, they want to have safe trains, but he was over there saying, uh, these, these look really good to me. And I mean, you may have seen, speaking of rail, right? I mean, the Chinese government now making these announcements with Columbia, US backyard, right? We want to do a rail link, you know, sort of the, to uh, compete with the Panama Canal. You've already done the narrowest point, so let's do the widest. I, I, interesting state planning. But none, nonetheless, right? I mean, clearly, these are game changer type investments as they occur. And, you know, we talked about just how, Ken talked earlier about just how dramatic the economic changes are occurring. Japan's economy is growing at roughly zero. The Chinese economy is growing at almost 10% a year. And the state's directing this investment still overwhelmingly towards infrastructure. So if you think that your question is relevant today, it's going to become exponentially more relevant in three and five years' time. And a lot of corporations are still thinking in shorter time horizons. Boeing, Boeing three years ago, we're going to sell, three years ago, we're going to sell 50% of our planes for 20 years to the Chinese, right? Now they've got a 737 that's not going to be able to compete in 20 years. Think how quickly that happened. But that's what happens when you have shareholders that report every quarter. Now the Japanese aren't quite that bad, right? But still, they don't have the level of being strategic that the Chinese do. Now the one thing that works eventually against China on this front is that the Chinese, like everyone, globalization, are increasingly captive to constituency. I mean, they're not going to start having democratic elections, but they do have to pay more attention to what their constituents want. And ultimately, as China becomes itself more globalized and more urbanized and more educated and more transparent, it means that the Chinese government will become less strategic. They'll become, less, they'll become more tactical and they will less be able to devote those sorts of five-year plans. That's interesting. We'll probably undermine a lot of what they're trying to do. Okay, over there, those two questions, and then the third, and then that's going to be it. Short questions. Please. I want to get all of you on time to see you now. Yes, quite to the point. I'm Henry Roosh, an independent economist and teacher. Um, considering the truly important strategic role of the United States in the defense of both Japan and South Korea as the Chinese Navy expands and becomes more uh, solidified in the near seas, what should be and what are the options for the United States naval, in terms of naval power? Please. Thank you. Well, the, the threshold question is what kind of budget is the Navy going to have? Uh, to build ships and, and keep ships uh, sailing. Um, then I would say, um, you know, the, you know, can we engage the Chinese in a discussion about how um, 
uh, the near seas and the far seas are uh, global commons that uh, um, we should in some sense share that uh, what the US Navy does shouldn't be seen as threatening to China. Now, that may be a hard sell. Uh, it, it's seen in Chinese eyes it, it, and, and uh, in terms of some of the things they see us doing. But you know, from the United States point of view, uh, that's where we should probably position ourselves. And the man is right behind you. Ashwin Madhapali, City Group. One of the questions that I had was in 1972, the chairman of uh, Cornado met with Dazo and Ally in Beijing. And they said, you know, the Senkaku Islands are a minor thing. We'll just kind of paper over it and kind of deal with it. But this time around, it was a much more combative, almost violent reaction. Is there anything that sort of explains this transition and how the outcome transpired? Yes, as I think we were saying before, uh, there's a lot in the way this issue was handled. The, the timing with which it arose, it rose at the worst possible time in terms of a coherent uh, Japanese response. One almost wonders somewhere, uh, uh, Richard was talking about groups that might not be under full control. The, the possibility, it seems to me, of provocation possibly could have been there because the timing was such. Uh, it was at the worst possible time as far as the Japanese uh, were concerned in terms of a coherent response. I think that's the, the, big, the big difference together with the forces that uh, Richard talks about in his book. Um, just because it happened that way this time doesn't mean that it would happen every, every time that way. Um, I'd only say that this, this testing by elements of the Chinese regime of Japanese control of the Senkaku, it's been going on for a while. And uh, you know, to understand why, I think you'd have to go back to sort of nationalism and um, sort of transformation of a uh, sort of resource issue uh, into more one of a sort of territorial issue. So one, one of the big questions I wanted to get into that we didn't was nationalism in two countries and how they did it. But only down one more question and Sharon Chang, Addis Capital. Um, I was wondering if there were any particular incident that happened between China and North Korea that's constraining China from putting pressure, um, you know. North Korea now, or is that more of a function of its current regime? Um, August 14th, 2008, Kim Jong-il's stroke. Um, you know, that um, sort of raised huge uncertainties about the future of North Korea, uh, its stability, uh, its preservation as a strategic buffer for China. Um, and uh, it, it increased the sort of management task that China saw. Uh, I mean, it, it believes it has a way to get from here to there now, and it, it means sort of supporting this regime more than it did. Uh, but that's the sort of the, the event that triggered the current set of uh, current trends. Okay, and Ian has something to say about nationalism. Sure, uh, just, I think it's an important issue, and so I'm glad you raised it. It, it links in with with um, what Nick had to say about globalization. Uh, so, so much of what we've seen, this notion that the internet and the rise of social networking and communications revolution is democratizing and creates liberalism. And part of the reason we believe that is because the folks that it hit initially were folks predisposed to that in the developed advanced industrial economies and elites urbanized elites in the emerging markets that were most oriented towards that themselves. That's now changing. And these technologies, this globalization is hitting everyone. As it does, you realize that it's not that the technology inherently makes you a liberal. It's the technology inherently empowers individuals to say more of what they want. I mean, you give the Israelis and the Palestinians a lot more technology, they will make it much louder internationally that there are some real problems with their narratives and that they don't like each other very much. And I think the issue in, in China and Japan is precisely that a lot of these underlying problems are real. A lot of this zero-sumness is growing. 
And the potential that as you see more globalization, that it's not the Chinese regime that's threatened, but that rather the nationalism turns outward. There are three options, right? One is the Chinese government is able to create more openness, manage that, and channel it in a way that's more international and responsible. More likely if they can hold off until they become much wealthier. The second is that it starts to really destabilize the internal Chinese regime. The third is it is externally directed, right? In Egypt, that wasn't going to happen, right? I mean, Israel wasn't even mentioned. It, as a concept, one of the most interesting non-headlines that over the last three weeks, no one in Egypt talked about Israel. How wonderful that that, how wonderful, how non-violent. Could have gone a lot worse. In China, that is absolutely unclear. So, interesting. Okay, it's 7.30. We're going to let you go off to your Valentine rendezvous. Please join me in thanking you. Sign and on behalf of Japan's society,